So Monty Python and the Secret Lair. <laughs> Missed opportunity for titling there. It really right? was. I'm for one. Well, well, my 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 female friend came over. Mm -hmm. uh, my my lady friend came over and we watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail. She's a huge fan of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I told her about the Secret Lair. She's like, we need to watch the movie together. So we did that. Great film. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic film. Completely forgot the opening bit of the opening credits where they have the like Nordic subtitles. And yeah. I was like messing with it. I'm like, why are there? It says English subtitles. She's like, honey, that's, that's part that's of the, the that's the joke at the beginning of the film. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> the guy who does the sacking has been sacked. The guy who does the sacking has been sacked. <laughs> God, if you have not watched a Monty Python movie, you are doing yourself a great disservice. Particularly the Holy Grail, phenomenal. Yes. Um, the ending, hilarious, fantastic ending. Because it doesn't. It's just done. It's a cop out. It's, they just they're like, eh, we run out of money. We're done. <laughs> it's fantastic. Highly, highly recommend. But we are going to be talking a little bit about the new Secret Lair drop. Which, if you are watching us record this live, when it posts to the Patreon feed, patreoncom slash Bros, or to live feeds, it's already too late. You've missed it. Already missed it. It's already Sorry, sold guys. out. I already got my foil and non-foil versions of both of the volumes because um, it's a great. I love. I love Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and and the lady friend wants some for her. She doesn't play magic at all. No, but she's like, this is amazing, and it's like a little crossover between between our two things that we like a whole lot. So it's like, okay, cool. You get, you got a, you got a, you had a frame for cards. We're going to yeah. frame them up. Gonna frame, it'd be great. Be like, there you go. Then, yeah. Cause I feel it's one of those things where it's like, you don't, you know, you don't play magic, then you get those and you're like, cool. I have them now. What do hmm. I do? What do I do? Especially because the, the between there's two volumes, there's two different groupings of, uh, Monty Python cards mm -hmm. for this secret layer. So there's technically two drops that are happening at the same time. And in totals nine cards, and the in the frame is like a nice three by three nine card slots, yeah. which is perfect. Except they always give you the bonus cards. Yeah. So she's actually going to end up getting eleven cards. So two of them are not going to end up in the frame. Now, what are we going to do with those two? I don't know. Who knows? But I might just end up getting more of these like interlocking card frames. I mean, ultimately, we do love these these interlocking these card frames. These are so the BCW interlocking card frames. Highly recommend. Not a sponsor. I don't think we even have a link anywhere. Where you no, can I don't affiliate, think so but they're just really freaking good. Love those cards. Anyway, <laughs> while we will be talking about Monty Python and the Secret Lair, the more important thing is Wizards of the Coast has a new president finally. Yes. John Height has been hired as Wizards of the Coast president. We're going to get into that a little bit later. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some rules changes that have come out with Magic the Gathering's Bloomboro, particularly with the pre-combat and post-combat main phases, which are being done away with, and the ramifications and the controversy that has happened from that. And the adjustments that Wizards of the Coast has made because of people not liking the change. Yeah. Which is wonderful. We love to see that. Uh, they're also not banning Nadu. <laughs> well, <laughs> not not yet, not anyway. Yet. There's, it's yeah. it's going to end up happening. Like, we're... It's going to end up happening. And uh, the comic book rights for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and & Dragons have been shipped to a new entity, Dark Horse Comics. And we're going we're gonna to talk all about that in a little bit. But Sam... We're going to Gen Con this weekend. Yes, we are. We are recording this on the Tuesday before Gen Con. This will post for patrons on the Patreon at patreon.com slash Dungeon Bros. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, which is the Wednesday before Gen Con. And by the time this is on free feeds, Gen Con will have already happened. Um, I'm I'm excited because we've talked about it before. I managed to get a press pass. You did, yes. Which is fantastic. Very excited. Uh, there is a private Wizards of the Coast hosted event for to show off a lot of the new D&D &D stuff specifically, uh, specifically the Player's Handbook, on the Wednesday before Gen Con, which is tomorrow, tomorrow. as we're recording this. And I'm going to be able to go to that, which is really cool. Really excited for that. Uh, we're going to be driving up on Thursday. Um, we don't have, like, a ton of plans. I've plan I have I've set up uh, a meeting with the guys that make the One Ring RPG because mm -hmm. they've got, like, a Minds of Moria expansion. Going to talk to them a little bit about that. Seems pretty cool. Uh, you've, you're you doing a tour of TCGs. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm uh, going to... Obviously, we've been playing Magic now for two years. Two full oh, man. years. Because oh, uh, we started at Gen Con two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also going to learn to play Pokemon, uh, Flesh and Blood, and the Star Wars Unlimited TCG that came out earlier this year. That's awesome. And no Yu-Gi-Oh option, it seemed. Uh, uh, or just not interested. Uh, you know what? I don't need to be associated with the Yu-Gi-Oh crowd. 
they're, they're I may have a, a blue eyes and a red eyes on my body, but that is true. That is true. I got I I've, I've got a nice little collection of old cards of Yu Gi Oh from mm-hmm. back in the day. The day. Uh, I remember when there was the there was the one Yu Gi Oh movie that came out in theaters that had like the shining metal blue eyes that mm. if you went to the movie you got the promo card with your ticket kind yeah. of thing, and I had that. And I'm like, this is really cool. And then I, like barely understanding the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh tried to make a deck with it and I was like oh this is like impossible to cast (laughs) in like or summon sorry it's impossible to summon in like any way effectively Uh, but yeah Yu-Gi-Oh is a is a game where turn one and turn two wins are just the formats yeah of everything (laughs) you just you win quickly or you don't yeah so I played quite a few Yu-Gi-Oh! video games through the years, but those mm-hmm. are always a play on the Yu-Gi-Oh! IP mm. itself more than the actual game. Mm. I remember the there was the Sacred Cards, which was kind of like a retelling of Battle City. Mm, okay. uh, you played it, you played as your own character alongside the Yu-Gi-Oh! cast, and ultimately you ended up being the hero instead of Yu-Gi because obviously yeah but like the the deck building in there is fun Mm -hmm. and because it's anime Yu-Gi-Oh the power level way lower oh yeah so it's much easier to build a competent deck that you can then play against people and I really I really enjoyed that it was on the Game Boy Advance so not really applicable for most people yeah I played uh, the I played two that I have in memory one is Capsule Monsters Mm -hmm. which was more like these are these are Yu-Gi-Oh themed chess almost it wasn't exactly chess but it was the idea of like Interesting. it was on a, it was on a grid and you would your each monster had a different uh move and attack pattern and it was uh always little like chess pieces oh oh was it was it dungeon dice monsters no it was uh capsule monsters oh it was okay so was there a dungeon dice monsters video game because i remember they made like a board game product for dungeon dice monsters yeah. and i got that board game and it was awesome and i loved it and at some point when i was an adult in college i came back and a lot of my shit was gone mm. including the dungeon dice monsters which is infuriating because that that thing has like a cult classic following even though it like it came out and i think there was like an expansion for it and then it was done but it was like i mean it's, it was the coolest two episodes of the of, right? uh, of the series i'm surprised they didn't like spin it off into its own thing ultimately like it was really freaking cool yeah but i'm at there has to be a video game of it right probably i don't know i don't know i don't know right in right in patreon.com slash the dungeon bros which if you go and you support us you can join for free by the way for you, free for free And you can get access to the question thread, which we post every Friday before we start recording to ask us questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas for the podcast. Uh, We also do some free posts up there as well, usually bonus actions, uh, because we're trying to release them like very quickly. We're going to be recording a bonus action later today Mm -hmm. with our good friend Typical Gemini as a review of the Bloomborough Magic the Gathering set. We're going to post that as quickly as possible, and that'll be available on the free feeds for everybody as quickly as possible, Uh, because this weekend of Gen Con is the release week. Weekend yes, full for, release for Bloom Barrel. Uh, Cliff Notes version is a good set. Oh yeah, it's a real good set. Big fan, a lot of fun. Huge fan, except the value packs. Don't buy the value packs. Don't buy the value packs. No, no, never buy. Never buy. And they're just they keep trying. They keep trying to push the aftermath packs, right? And I don't. And like these are kind it. of the opposite of aftermath packs, where it's like, oh, you're definitely not guaranteed anything above an uncommon. Literally. Now, are there a lot of good commons and uncommons in Bloomboro? Absolutely, absolutely. What we were we were talking about on live Stargaze, mm-hmm. uh, a a shockingly good uncommon that I feel like not a lot of people are talking about. But we'll get into that in the Bloomboro v- review with Typical Gemini, which is going to be a wonderful time. Um, but yeah, if you join the Patreon, five dollars early ad free access to all the podcasts. Uh, Fifteen dollars, you get your name read at the end of the show. Yeah, which is a wonderful time, as one patron does. But We'll get into that. Oh, we did all the things. We did all. The, oh, we didn't even. <laughs> silly us, silly us. It, we're, we're how long? I mean, what are what are we? What are we like? Ten minutes into the podcast? Seems uh, just about. Welcome to <laughs> the Duels and Manadors podcast. I'm Connor, and I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. No, no, we are not in a dungeon. No, we are not. We were, we were contemplating turning this into a dungeon, and then we realized how much work that would be. That would be a lot of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of a... few frames upon the wall, that's about as much... Uh, yeah, as much. a nice table to play magic. Yeah. We play D&D downstairs, just because it's a little cramped in here. 
And the, you build the whole table downstairs I did. for D and D. So you I know, did. I did. Might as well use it. Might as well. Might as well. That thing is. That thing is a trooper. It's a fucking chunktastic bitch, <laughs> for sure. You know, if we really, if like we were in some sort of home alone situation, we could probably rig it to just flatten an intruder. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. is quite hefty. <sighs> Man. Yeah. Yeah, that thing is that thing is a very big boy. Anyway, anyway, okay, we do all that. Uh, okay, you're playing Bellatro. Yeah, picked up Bellatro the other day. Uh, poker. It's exactly like regular poker. It's yes. a video game. You can get it on. Is it PlayStation Plus right you now? You can get it on everything. Is it a PlayStation it Plus premium now. game? Oh, you just no, got I just the bought game. it. Oh, yeah, I've seen a lot about it, and I it's a it's a roguelike deck builder. Fun fact. Um, everything. I've, we need to. There needs to be like a council. For video game terms, because mm-hmm. I feel like everything's a roguelike, Everything. everything's an action adventure. These terms, do, there's a lot of souls, souls likes that are like not even kind of like a Soulsborne game. <laughs> but and that's, that's that's a whole other. I mean, there also probably needs to be that council for magic, honestly, of like unifying terminology. Yeah, but community council, community council. Like, is it typal? <laughs> is it kindred? Who, yeah, who knows? Are we are we going to go back to tribal because? I mean, who cares? <laughs> who cares? Yeah, nothing to do with rules. Nothing to do with, you know, what, what, what Watsy says. Just to make sure we're all on the same we're page. We're all on the same page. Who is Tim? What is a Gary? You know? <laughs> we know. We know Steve. We know Steve. Steve. We know Steve. Love Steve. Probably doesn't need to go in every deck, though. No, that's, it has its spots, but... It's, it's fine. It's a fine card. It's fine. Anyway, this is completely <laughs> off base. You like Bellatro? I like Bellatro. I like Bellatro a lot. You gonna start playing poker now? Doing poker nights? No. Get the chips out? Is it because the cards don't have magical properties? They don't have magical <laughs> properties. What would I do without magical properties? I don't understand. Uh, from what I've heard, that game is like super addicting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've also been... So I got... I, I The past weekend has been very full and I'm very exhausted. Uh, and I think it's just like... It's very simple in its concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's why I've just been also focusing in so hard on it. It's like, I don't want to think about anything right now. Yeah, just mindless... Ooh, number get big. Love love a game that's all about number get big. It's number get big. Each it's very snappy. Like each each, mm-hmm. you know. You, thankfully, so many video games have made the uh, option now where it's like, oh, you can speed up the animations. You know, mm-hmm. back in the day, you had to be like, I'm opening a thing. Boom. Yeah. And then it does all the. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And thankfully, now so many games are like, yeah, now you can go that a little faster or way faster. So I was like, boom. Okay, I can go. Yeah, and just, like, get through it. The animation's bogging down, like, action games specifically drives me fucking nuts when mm-hmm. it, like, I've, I'm, I've been slowly replaying some of the, the Kingdom Hearts games. Yeah. Uh, just in my downtime at work. <laughs> no one tell my boss. Uh, but, like, there's particularly, like, the handheld games where they had, like, command decks and stuff where you like just load up all of your fun abilities that Mm -hmm. you want to use a lot of them a lot of the cool ones that are like flashy and fun they have like a second and a half of a wind-up animation and no iframes yeah so like outside of just kind of like trash mobs around the world like you're not going to be doing it in like the arenas where you're fighting like harder fights Mm -hmm. because you're going to be like stood there and there's going to be this energy swirling and you're winding up and you're going to get hit out of it and it's like okay now i gotta wait fucking 30 seconds for the ability to recharge and it's it's a whole thing it's a whole thing get rid of the wind-up animation i know it's a balancing tactic for some things but like with with i correct me if i'm wrong with like elden ring and soulsborne stuff like when you're having a big heavy weapon like there's not really a wind-up animation it's just like it, the attack takes a little longer, but it hits harder, right? Uh, it depends. Well, yeah, it's uh, long hold based. So mm. if you yeah, if you hold it longer, there is a bigger attack. Mm. Um, there's the heavy attack, the light attack. Uh, but do you get do you get to control how long that hold is to try and get more damage out? Sometimes, depending on the weapon. Mm. Uh, they also though uh, in it's a hidden. It's technically a, a hidden stat. It's poise. Well, it's hidden in the early ones, but it's poise. So it's like, if you want to make sure you get through with this big heavy weapon attack and not get knocked out of it, you better be having, you better have a high poise, which is based on stats and armor. It's kind of, is that kind of like a, like a resisting a stagger? Yeah. Stagger resist and among other things. Oh, okay. 
Anyway, the, none of this is pertinent to anything that we talk about here on the Duels and Mandorks podcast, a D&D and Magic the Gathering podcast. But imagine if you're playing magic and they're like, what's your, st- what's your stagger resist? And you're like, I don't know. I'm going to cast and they punch you in the face. <laughs> they just hit you. <laughs> like, I don't want to play this anymore. I want That's a new pod. That's so rude. <laughs> That's such a rude thing. Anyway. All right. Uh, we're going to go through the upcoming releases for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons as we do with every single episode, Sam. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there are no more 2014 fifth edition releases for Dungeons and Dragons. R.I.P. in pieces. My God. Yes. I, I, we've we've been talking about one D and D. We've been doing. We've been looking at the play tests. We've been seeing everything they've been talking about, and it's just like I am. I'm ready to move over to the system with all the fun bits yep. in it. You know. And and very soon we shall be official releases mm-hmm. for the one D and D or the 2024 revision of fifth edition. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it very, very, it's rolls right off the right tongue. Right off the tongue. Right off the tongue. Uh, so the One D&D Player's Handbook will be released fully on September 17th of this year. So about a month and a half away. But, 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 but. This is very important. If you are going to Gen Con this weekend in Indianapolis, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, set an alarm for like 6.50 in the morning. Okay? I know. I know. Set an alarm for 6.50 in the morning. Go onto the website. Look up the... Player's Handbook Purchase Event, you will be able to get a free ticket starting at 7 a.m. each day, and they're going to limit the number of tickets that you can get. If you have one of those free tickets, you can go to the Wizards of the Coast booth, and you can buy a copy of the new revision of the Player's Handbook at Gen Con. And I think they're doing like 250 of those a day, 700, I don't don't remember the exact number. I think they're doing like 750 over the whole weekend. Oh, so, so not a lot. Not a ton. It's the biggest four days in gaming. There's a lot of fucking people. So you set your alarm, try to get those tickets, and you might be able to get access to the book pretty early. And I mean, at Gen Con, a lot of the a lot of the designers and writers and stuff are going to be milling about. You might even be able to see them and be like, hey, sign, sign my new yeah. book. That'd be pretty cool. Don't pretty cool. lick them. Do That's them. rude. The people or the book? The, pe- the book. You, if, uh, the, sorry, the <laughs> If you see Jeremy Crawford, <laughs> lick him. Lick him. It's rude to lick the brand new book, but you can lick the people that made the book. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway. anyway, moving on. September 17th. September 17th. If you can't do it at Gen Con. <laughs> uh, then moving on to the Dungeons Master's Guide. It will be coming out on November 12th of this year. And finally, to wrap up the Core Rulebooks releases, the Monster Manuel. Monster Manuel. Manuel, relay instruction. That will be released on February 18th of next year. Very exciting. Um, very, very exciting. I can't wait to see what they do with like campaign setting books mm-hmm. and campaign books in general because I feel like they're going to be sleeked, sleeked down, modernized, kind yeah. of easier to run experiences, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, that was a big, that's something they talked about as a big design goal with uh, the core rule books already is just making sure the rules that you need to know are where they're going to be, the, that the book layout makes sense, mm-hmm. that the art matches the, lay, the design of the, of the chapter and mm-hmm. things like that. And that's that's one thing I've experienced with some of the setting books and some of the campaign books that I flipped through is just like a lot of the information is is where you want it. But there's a lot of times where it's like, OK, you know, you need to flip over to this page or you need to dig through this index or you need to go through mm-hmm. this lot and like just trying to find the stuff that you need. And at the table, that just slows everything right to a halt. As uh, my, my friend said to me recently, he's like, there's two game designers in all of us. The one that says put all the information on every page and the one that says make an appendix. Yeah, I'm. And there's there's definitely like instances where it's like a, one is better than the other, but it, it it also depends on what the the quality of the information is. Like you don't need to put what the frightened condition does on every single page that uses the frightened condition. Right. You can have one unified place for that, but you probably should also have frightened, and then in parentheses put p dot, and then the page number that you can find where the frightened condition is. Yes. Or in a digital book, put a fucking hyperlink. Oh, I love the hyperlink. Which. We did that for our Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement. You can get it on Patreon or Drive Through RPG. It's a good time. It's a good time. And I I we've been playing we've been playing a game of D D recently. We have. Dark Souls inspired. Mm-hmm. We just had our first board wipe. <laughs> we just had we just had our first party wipe. But the whole the whole bit is that we come back after like a set day every single week kind of a thing. But we lose the experience we gained. Mm-hmm. And we've been using experience as like a resource for leveling up, for gaining feats, for getting magic items, for all that kind of stuff. And that's very interesting. But the scale at which certain 
buffs are happening seems a bit off. I, I, I'd really like to dig into that for a supplement because I feel like that'd be really fucking cool. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Not a lot of time. Nope. But it's a, good, mean, it's a fun idea to experiment with new uh, ways to use experience. I was going to say, like, as I mean, hopefully we, we play this game for not just like stopping immediately, mm-hmm. but we continue to play it and we can hopefully in a, in a kind of a, 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 a work as you go thing. Build yeah, I, as you go. I like how we've been kind of slowly appending some of the stuff because we because our, our DM just kind of they kind of pulled some homebrew stuff that they just found mm-hmm. and kind of massaged it a little bit themselves. But we kind of been massaging it as we go as well. Uh, so like one thing, we're not going to lose the experience if we die again before we kill the thing that killed us. Yeah. Because uh, we're not going to be killing the Solar and Planetar and Deva that killed our level eight characters. Yeah. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. But if we ever eventually do kill them, uh, we'll get our experience back, which compared to the amount of experience those stat blocks offer. I mean, yeah, yeah. well, now, the, now, ooh, I need to, I need to bring this up to them because I did manage to kill the Deva. It got a, re- it got resurrected immediately. Yeah, but I did manage to kill it. Are we going to? Are we? Is, is that experience from the original kill of the Deva going to be added if we then go back and kill them again? Good I think question. it should. But we've been kind of working through it a little bit. We, we're gonna, we're gonna really be working on the scale at which we're getting experience and the cost of certain things. Mm-hmm. Because, like, um, our friend Darren and I, we were spending our experience on some, like, lower stuff just because, like, I'm, I'm a fighter barbarian. Like, I want a magic weapon. Yeah. Because, like, you ju- just being able to get through the magic resistance. Yeah, for, for martial classes or classes that, yeah, like to do, mm-hmm. like, the weapon is a great and a very easy thing to, like, start to put yes more things into dump experience into so i got a plus one great sword and i modify i used my experience to modify it to give it the we call it the vicious property Mm -hmm. and so like if i roll maximum damage on a damage dice i get to roll it again once it has vicious one if it had vicious two if i did it a second time i'd be able to do it again Mm -hmm. but that's come up once so far where i've rolled a six and i'm like oh sweet i pick it up and i roll it again and it was a six again i'm like i can only do this once but that's kind of inspired by uh, systems like, oh, what's the, what's the, oh. Any, any of those systems where things explode. It's the, um, it's the, the Wild West one. Yeah. Undeadwood. Un, uh, that, Deadwood. Undeadwood. Undeadwood is the game they ran. I don't on remember. Critical this, role on from, Critical Role from He Who Must Not Be Named. But what that system? Yeah, I don't. They remember. had I don't remember either. But they had a damage explosion or a dice explosion system, which you just roll max on the dice, and then you get to roll it again and add the two together. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was able to dump a lot of my experience into getting that item, which has like really helped me out. But you're a spellcaster. Yeah. So like getting stuff through that system is a lot harder. You lost a lot more experience on the yeah. death than we did, <laughs> just because you hadn't had anything to spend it on, really. Pretty much, yeah. So that's one thing. I mean, they asked us after that game uh, our thoughts and, like, maybe how do we want to do that going forward? Do we want to abandon the, lo- you know, the lose on life do we, or lose on death sort of thing? So mm-hmm. I've been thinking about that because, like, it's, you know, on one, on one hand, that was definitely kind of a scripted fight almost. Yeah, it was very – we were meant to lose that fight. We were not meant to – I think I think they were shocked that I managed to, like – down one down of one of them yeah <laughs> which i mean i've like focused that one down i used my action surge i attacked a ton of times i used all of my battle master ability like i dumped everything in one turn yeah which is not something that i'm really ever going to do but i we all kind of understood implicitly like oh we're not meant to win this no when when the third member of our party had already been incinerated before their turn started yeah. it was like oh, okay we're not meant to win this so i'm gonna just dump everything and see what happens because i think that's interesting oh yeah absolutely and it was it was a fun it was a fun session even though we got wiped and it like cre- i think it's going to create a lot of like interesting sort of like the experience of death and rebirth and all that but that's that's neither here nor there okay that's no. probably that's probably going to be the last we talk about D. <laughs> there's a lot of magic stuff and just yes. general watsy stuff but going on to the magic releases oh god that was only the one D stuff Going on to the magic releases, we have first up Bloomboro. The pre-release is now. If you are watching live, yes, we had our Bloomboro pre-release live stream for Monday Night Magic. That was very fun. Played some limited. Yeah. Uh, is it otters? A little tough to run without the correct pieces, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That I I was struggling to put a deck together because it's like all the archetypes that I wanted. Because I pulled I pulled Mabel, Air yeah. Crag Flame. 
I had one mouse in that pre-release kit <laughs> other than her. So I was like, okay, that's not very helpful. It's just that's kind of the luck of the draw and variance with the with the pre-release kits. Though. Yeah, it's just finding something to put together. It's also, I think, certain archetypes had, uh, tend to stand out very well in the limited environment. Mm-hmm. And I also had a gruel option, a mm-hmm. gruel like big stuff. Now, that might have gone a little better, but eh, here, neither here nor there. It, it is what it is. I went with like an Orzhov, like life gain and drain style mm-hmm. thing. Um, a whole lot of a whole lot of triggers based on if you if I have gained or lost life in on that turn, yeah. then I get benefits on the end step kind of thing. And I'm it in a limited environment, life gain, and then just like I you mean, had white. some great evasion on your creatures too. Me- oh my god the 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 ravine raider the yeah. the one mana one one lizard with menace that you can dump one in a black into to buff plus one plus one on every single turn in a limited environment is fantastic yeah a one one evasive creature for one mana that you can then make bigger like highly highly <laughs> recommend if you're playing draft getting the ravine raider if you're in black but or your life craft duo oh life white craft. just just etb gain life yeah and it's a flyer and it's a flyer and uh, i like i between the life creed duo and the moonrise cleric the mm-hmm. one Orzhov mana, Orzhov mana, uh, flying, and then you get the life gain on attack. So yeah. it was like more repeatable, even if I wasn't able to get creatures out to trigger the life gain abilities for my other stuff. But it was a fun time. You should check out Monday Night Magic. We go live on TikTok and YouTube, playing Match the Gathering every Monday night. Every Monday night, it's a, it's a good time. But anyway, so the pre-release is out now. If you're, yes. li- uh, but if you're listening to the recording of this, then it's out. The full thing is out now. Yes. August second is the full drop. Yeah, full drop is at Gen Con, so it's we're very Gen excited. Con. We're gonna try and sneak into the Commander Precon event because we weren't able to get tickets for it. We waited too long. Too long. It was our, it was our own fault. We should have known better. All right, moving on to Duskmorn House of Horrors. That pre-release will be on September 20th, with the full release one week later on September 27th. Mm-hmm. And then finally for this year, Foundations. Uh, which will be released on November 15th. Yes, Foundations is like the new standard. It, it's the core sets. It's the standard of standard. It's the stand, It's the most standard of standard. Foundations is basically core sets now. They have a five-year rotation for standard as just the foundation set, so it's kind of breaking the rules of standard mm-hmm. a little bit. But I, I've been listening to, or, you know, I like to watch my other, the other uh, uh, Magic the Gathering content in the world, and so far, like I've heard, definitely like two or three people, uh, like creators. I think like I've heard Brian Kibler and Kathleen Devere f- both say, "I didn't work on. I, or, I I worked on Foundation, so that's exciting that I can say that now that it's been announced. So it's like you can definitely see where they're pulling a lot of uh, yeah, they, a lot of people from. That's and that's honestly, that's honestly very encouraging about Foundations is that it feels more collaborative Mm -hmm. and they recognize it it seems like they recognize that standard is important as a format and it just hasn't been going very well for a while so yeah it's nice to see i think that it it's going to be a very standard (laughs) no pun intended set nothing's like super crazy like duskmorn uh or bloomborough for that matter because i mean we got some very weird mechanics there got some weird mechanics yeah it'll be they're cool interesting great in a limited environment Mm mm-hmm We'll see where they come in I think, constructed format. I mean, as much as Lincoln hates it when we say this, it's all pretty much just kicker. <laughs> the the yeah. gift cards from Bloomborough, that's just kicker. You, you it's an extra cost. It could say it could say kicker, an opponent creates a tap fish. Yeah. Uh, it could just say uh, instead of offspring three, it could just say kicker three. If the kicker cost was paid, you make a one one copy, copy of, of this creature. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. It's all effectively kicker. It's anyway. All. Anyway. Everything is kicker. Moving on. Before we get back to the rest of this episode of the Duels in Mana Dorks podcast, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, ProxyForge. ProxyForge creates high quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like Tutors and the Swords. You can also get upgrade packs for Commander Precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite Precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire, as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. With the big news. On to the real news. On to the real news news wizards of the coast and hasbro have announced a new president for the company we have we have lost 
we have lost the greatness that was Christopher Penis and Cynthia Will She Ruin Watsy. They did. They did ruin Watsy. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ruin it. They just, it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. But we have a new president of Wizards of the Coast and the digital gaming uh, division is John Height. John previously served as the senior vice president and general manager of the Warcraft franchise at Blizzard Entertainment, overseeing all development and commercial activities for World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, and Warcraft Rumble. During his 12-year tender tenure at Blizzard, John directed development efforts for multiple World of Warcraft expansions, Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls, and Diablo 3 on console. John's addition marks a significant step in Hasbro's strategic focus on digital experiences and video games. His role will include oversight of Hasbro's network of gaming studios and digital licensing agreements, and he will also lead strategy for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons while driving continued gro uh, global growth for the division and uncovering new storytelling, tabletop, and digital experiences. So, uh, Blizzard... Known Very company. Known known big entertainment company. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hearthstone is in many ways a video game card game that is inspired by Magic the Gathering. Oh, absolutely. In yeah. a lot of ways. Uh, it doesn't really have a mana system to my knowledge. I don't know Hearthstone very well. Yeah, I was going to say, I also know the one of the biggest differences is there's i mean there's creatures enchantment that that, that whole mm -hmm. the gameplay is very similar except there's no interaction system there's no interact so everything's at sorcery speed yeah as far as i'm as far as i've been made aware interesting interesting which i mean it's kind of in a way a little bit fair in a video game sense mm -hmm. um just let just letting people do their stuff yeah oh, uh, instead of like a lockout thing but what i do know about john high uh hiked height is, is it height or high? I don't know. H-I-G-H-T. I assume height. Height. John Height. So one thing that is known old about... Johnny jo Boy. Hello, Johnny Boy. Uh, one thing that's known about good old Johnny Boy here, uh, the Prez, Johnny Boy, is he is a known player of both Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. Thank the fucking lord yeah when when the two most previous being christopher cox and cynthia williams christopher cox has been on record you know he he, he, he said oh yeah i would be at i would be at cocktail parties and people be like oh can you tell me about these these ips of yours dungeons and dragons or, I, or Ma magic gathering and he'd go nope nope he was a businessman he was a businessman nothing wrong with that uh, nothing wrong we, we need businessmen in the world we do then it's true then it's true cynthia so williams not sure what she's about. I. She was quite. She was questionable right out of the gate, because it felt. It felt like immediately when she took on the role of president of Wizards of the Coast, it was. Oh, D and D is under monetized. Oh, we need to push microtransactions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm pretty sure she was the one that was like, well, let's try. Let's try these booster packs, that are a lot fewer number. There are a lot fewer cards in a pack but they're the same price how can we do how can we spend less money to make more money yeah um so she was like trying to cut down on things and trying to squeeze the consumer a little bit more which was not popular no uh she was the one that oversaw the pinkertons being sent after a content creator to collect aftermath booster packs by the way people forget that the Pinkertons weren't sent out because of March of the Machines. They weren't sent out for like a Modern Horizons 3 leak or like a Masters set. Rings, nothing. Nope. None of that. No, it was for fucking March of the Machines Aftermath that they were sent out. That's crazy. Yeah. That is crazy, crazy shit. But the company that, uh, that, once, <laughs> that once wanted to, you know... How D and D is under monetized. I I will never I will never forget the D and D is under monetized quote from her. But with John Height, I think of the of the things that could have happened mm -hmm. with Cynthia leaving. This this guy seems like he would be the kind of person that would fit well at Wizards of the Coast and can actually do the things that will be successful for their main product lines. Yes. Um, coming in right as we're about to get the new revision of 5th edition, I think is going to help a lot in helping guide the strategy for, you know, like the 
all we all we know now are the core rule books and they're probably not going to really announce much until those core rule books are mostly all out maybe they'll maybe after the dungeon master's guy before the monster manual Man, possibly but i think he he's he knows D. he knows magic he knows video games he knows video games that are like magic and D yeah. in a lot of ways which like that it's it's kind of a perfect like a perfect resume for this yeah. position in a lot of ways and uh, 12 years at blizzard like i would if he's around for a decade and he's doing well like i think this this could be the f- this could be could be could be the fir- the first big step for like the new era mm-hmm. of magic and and D&D and wizards of the coast kind of like at at the right time yeah, they're they're really laying Wizards of the Coast is really laying down some new, no pun intended, foundations mm-hmm. with foundations, mm-hmm. and of course with the like you said the twenty twenty four revision coming out, um, and you know if he understands what the consumer wants, which clearly Cynthia was definitely in it for the investors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's that is important. Understandable. That is important. Investors invest because they think they're going to make money back. Yes, and if you don't show that you can make their money back they're not going to invest but you can't only focus on that yeah in a lot of industries absolutely like the investors in coke people are going to keep drinking coke yeah everybody loves coke uh fentanyl not so much um not 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 a huge fan of fent not a huge fan of methamphetamines generally speaking yeah um that's a whole other but diet we're we're a diet coke household here oh we are a proud diet coke household we are a proud aspartame consuming household but, Very proud. But yeah, they're absolutely focused on making Coke, you know, making a, a Coke product that people are just going to keep ripping off the shelves. Here, the the community who's buying it is also very invested in the company mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in a very different way. So, I mean, there are plenty of fans of Wizards of the Coast that actually do invest in, like, Wizards of the Coast stock, which you can do, and yeah. Hasbro stock, which you can do. Uh, but most, like, the success of the company leads to successful products and successful products grow the games that we love Mm -hmm. and make it more fun to be a part of those games which is really what we all want the big thing that you and i need to figure out here we've had christopher Mm -hmm. penis yes we've had cynthia wilshire ruin watsy what are we going to call john height don't know what's for that I, he really needs to he needs to, well we maybe maybe john will take us to new heights i don't know uh we really need him to do something that's the that's the thing that's chris the, cox was just a gimme that, that and chris cox was, i mean you just that was that was a that was a you're you're setting up a t-ball for the <laughs> fucking home run king in, in major league baseball and expecting <laughs> him not to hit it out of the park like come on yeah uh cynthia wilshire and watsy was just like oh man she's making some questionable decisions uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need a fun we're gonna need a fun nickname fun for, nickname for, for John Height. If you have any, leave them in the comments on on the YouTube video. You can watch the podcast on the YouTube video or like in on the Patreon under the comment section there. You can join for free. patreoncom slash Rose. Anyway, yeah, uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for this edition, but only time will tell. Only time will tell. And I think by the beginning of next year, once we have like the core D and D books out, once we have foundations in Magic the Gathering, we kind of have a roadmap of what like the coming Magic the Gathering stuff. Because he's not really going to be able to affect much of anything yeah. this year, even if he's hired immediately. They do a lot on a three year timeline, five year timeline. So he's going to be able to affect some of the projects that are in progress, but it's going to take until probably like 2026, 2027 before we see like stuff that was like truly developed from start to finish with him at the helm. At the helm. Yeah. So only time will tell. Cynthia didn't even get that long. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. We've got uh, many things that have come out from Bloomboro. Okay. Yes. And this is definitely going to be something that we discuss in our Bloomboro full review on bonus action, uh, which we'll be recording very soon with typical Gemini and should be out very, very soon as of the recording of this. But one of the things that has changed is the a new rules change for pre-combat and post-combat main phases. They're going away. They're done. They're going to now be numbered. So you have your first main phase and your second main phase. Because of that change in text, it has functionally changed a small collective of cards that Several of them had significant changes to what they were able to do. 
Uh, so there is a long list of cards that specifically have the pre-combat main phase listed. Those really aren't going to be affected in any meaningful way because you're still getting your first combat or your first, your first main, main phase, phase. Yeah. which will function effectively the same. Those cards are not really... Um, those are not really being affected in any meaningful way. The post-combat main phase cards are the ones that we are more interested in. Uh, so to go into Bloomboro, the two main cards that they showed that have this new terminology are the Fireglass Mentor and Marrera Trash Tactician. Uh, the Fireglass Mentor is the Rakdos Signpost Uncommon. That's a Lizard Warlock. Uh, it has, at the beginning of your second main phase, if an opponent lost a life this turn, exile the top two cards of your library, choose one of them, and until end of turn, you can play that card. Uh, and then the other one, Mura, Muera, Trash Tactician, uh, is a rare, it's a 2-4 Raccoon Warrior legendary creature. At the beginning of your first main phase, add a red mana or a green mana for each raccoon you control. Whenever you expend four, you gain three life, and whenever you expend eight, exile the top two cards of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play those cards. So, with the ch with the those are the two main cards that exemplify the change of uh, first main and second main phases. There are 27 cards outside of silver-bordered cards that refer to the pre-combat main phase. Those are not affected, but the 11 eternal legal cards that refer to the post-combat main phase are directly having uh, changes to them. Ten of them specifically. There's an 11th one, which is World at War, which is actually not really being affected at all because mm -hmm. it referenced the first post-combat main phase, which is now effectively just the, the second, second main phase. So functionally, World at War isn't affected. But there are 10 other cards that are being uh, meaningfully affected, uh, some such as Sphinx of the Second Sun, which is at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, there's an additional beginning phase after this phase. That one, that one has caused a lot of confusion. That's, for people. It's a very weirdly worded. Yeah, it's it's worded from a rules standpoint more than a readability standpoint. Effectively, the trigger goes on the stack on your post combat main phase or your second main phase now, and then it resolves, and then you get your a second beginning phase, which is untap, upkeep, draw after the, you finish the post combat main phase. Yes, or the second main phase. Uh, there's some other ones, uh, Belb, Corrupted Observer, Flair, Florian, Voldaren Scion, Kiri, Talented Sprout, which just came out. <laughs> Thunder Junction. <laughs> In Thunder Junction. Uh, Megatron, Tyrant, and Soren House of Markov, which just came out in Modern Horizons 3. Uh, but the big ones are Timna the Weaver, which is a big CEDH commander, partner commander. Uh, at the beginning of the post-combat main phase, you may pay X life, where X is the number of opponents that were dealt combat damage this turn. If you do, you draw X cards. That is effectively being eroded to second main, which is fine. Uh, but the big one is Neheb the Eternal. Neheb the Eternal is a three red red, four six zombie minotaur warrior with a flicked three. So whenever he becomes blocked, it deals three damage to the opponent that is blocking him. At the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you add a red mana for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. The reason these cards are being affected is because of additional combat step cards. Mm -hmm. Things like a combat celebrant that give you an additional combat step. Those cards generally give you an additional post-combat main phase after the additional combat, meaning these post-combat main phase cards get extra triggers mm -hmm. every single turn cycle. The big one is Neheb the Eternal because that card is a legendary creature. It's a mono red deck and those decks are built around extra combats to get multiple triggers for extra red mana and to just kind of drain your opponents a lot with Afflict 3 and just a ton of combats. With the changes, those cards would no longer function like this yeah. because the post-combat main phase is now the second main phase. And if you take an additional combat, you don't have a post-combat main phase anymore after that extra combat. You have a third main phase, which would not trigger these cards. This caused a massive, massive unrest amongst the community, particularly Neheb players. Yes. <laughs> and because of all the backlash to the rules change and errata, they actually are eroding these 10 cards specifically so that they will still function as they currently do. Um, so 
I think effectively the rules change is they are not removing post combat main phase from those cards and that will just be an outdated term that no mm-hmm. longer is used but they will still function in every main phase that happens after a combat so your second main your third main your fourth main props to them for listening to the community mm-hmm and making that change. Specifically, uh, Matt Tabak, who is one of the lead designers for Magic the Gathering, was the one that was kind of announcing a lot of this, and was the one who made the announcement on Twitter, saying, update, there are 11 cards in Oracle, plus three alchemy-only cards, that will continue to use the term post-combat main phase after Magic the Gathering Bloomborough. They will receive a small wording tweak to be more clear about how they work, which matches how they've always worked. This group includes Brazen Cannonade, Megatron, Clocknapper, and Neheb. I say this I say it this way to emphasize that this was never about any one particular card, power level, or a targeted functional change. Musingly, it does not include World at War because they actually it doesn't really affect the change at all. Uh, they and he wanted to note that pre-combat and post-combat will be depre- uh, deprecated terms and not be supported or, or are unlikely to appear on newer cards. But he also jokes that by simply saying that, it almost guarantees that those right. terms will be coming back at some point. But Wizards of the Coast and Magic the Gathering designers listening to the community about a rule change they were concerned about and fixing it. Yeah. Love to see it. I also, also... Kind of surprised that people were that upset about it, honestly. <laughs> you know, it does functionally change cards. That it is true. Does. And, it, and that's been one thing that they've definitely tried not to do in paper. Obviously, they can change in, in arenas very easily, and they do it all the time. Yeah, they just update the, they just update the, the, uh, the alchemy, alchemy versions of the cards. Um, But yeah, it's very hard to. It, it's kind of like. Hey, I know you um, purchased this apple, but now instead it's going to taste like a banana. So deal with that. Yeah. Uh, like obviously they changed. Um, this comes up sometimes at our in our pod. Uh, Fiend hunter and oblivion ring mm-hmm. are are differently templated than modern exile upon until something leaves the battlefield effects. And yes. It was, it was changed because those can be very easily. Um, they can be abused to function in a way that's different than what they were intended to function. Exactly. And now these are not... That's not what these were doing. Nothing was doing anything wrong. Yeah. The I mean, Neheb, when when people realized you can get multiple triggers off of Neheb, off of Timna the Weaver, off of all of these cards by having additional combats and additional co- post-combat main phases, that's part of the design of the card. Yeah. The design of Fiend Hunter and Oblivion Ring are you exile something. Mm-hmm. And then when that card is removed, the exiled thing comes back. Yes. But because on the cards, the text boxes are two separate triggers, if you have it enter the battlefield, and then you have the trigger to exile something go on the stack, and then you react to that trigger by destroying it or by blinking the enchantment or something like that. Somehow triggering the secondary. Yes. It goes, it exile, it goes away. So you get the leaves the battlefield trigger to resolve which will do nothing because nothing was exiled under it. And then the enters the battlefield trigger resolves exiling something, but because it is no longer on the battlefield, that card's just gone for good. Yeah. Modern templating of those cards is that it's all one trigger. So even if you try to do that flicker thing or remove the enchantment to try and permanently exile something, it basically just blinks the target Yes. at that point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, other, the other functional rule change that's happened in recent years was the companion mechanic. Uh, changing that from being able to put it in your hand for free that you have to pay three mana to get your companion card into your hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was just functional a functional change that affected only very specific cards that had that mechanic because the mechanic was so broken and powerful, uh, particularly things like Loris of the Dream Den and uh, the the Otter. That is Lord. the one that's banned in... It's banned in Commander. No, yeah. That's, oh, otter. sorry. Uh, that's uh, Lutra. Lutra. Yeah, because that, because that one... The companion restriction is all is, non-basic lands in your all non-basic land cards in your deck have to have different names, uh, which is every commander. Deck. I was saying commander that um, <laughs> all have red and blue in your color identity, literally, and you would just get an extra companion that has uh, benefits. But 
Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just glad. For one, I think the rules change it makes sense. Uh, pre combat and post combat main phases are more words than first main phase, second main phase. Uh, first is five letters. Pre combat is nine. <laughs> Post combat is ten, <laughs> which and they're it's clear in Bloomboro they're doing a lot of templating changes to remove mm-hmm. things going with enters instead of enters the battlefield, which we still get comments about on our TikTok video where I'm like it changes everything, which it does because people are going to be confused, and when they f- reprint things in the future, they're going to probably start doing enters instead of enters the battlefield. But I, I also like you did that. You kind of did that as like a one off what you did that in 15 20 minutes yeah like several months ago when they first announced it and yeah we're still getting constant still get comments about it constantly keep that interaction up guys we appreciate it yeah really yeah it really helps (laughs) really helps the channel uh all right uh the other the other big rules thing is uh the band and restricted announcement so with the release of modern horizons 3 modern as a format completely warped around several interactions and several strategies. The big one that everyone is talking about is the bird, Nadu Winged Wisdom, uh, combos with Shuko, Lightning Greaves. Um, there's another There's another equipment that has a zero equip that has the untap ability as mm-hmm. well. Uh, but effectively just getting many repeatable pseudo-infinite non-deterministic uh, the non-deterministic combos f- with Nadu and token generators off of Landfall, like uh, Scoot Swarm and uh, Springheart and Antuko. Mm-hmm. Basically, all of the top decks are running those things. Uh, there's a lot of CEDH tournaments where there's two, three, I think there was one CEDH tournament where all four of the decks at the top finals table were Nadu decks. It's kind of hilarious. Which is very funny. Uh, I think people just need to figure out Nadu and Fucking com- Spider-Man meme. Right. I think I think people just need to figure out how to handle Nadu in Commander, and I think Nadu as a commander will be fine. Hmm. If they wanted to make it a little bit more fair, I, I don't think it's necessary to ban Shuko in Commander or ban That'd be very- anything like that. I think that would just be a little bit much. But there's ways around Nadu. You remove the bird. You get a Dranith Magistrate out. At CEDH tables, if you get a turn one Dranith Magistrate, the Nadu player is kind of stuck Yeah. in general. Um, so there's ways to deal with it. And, the, and people were just trying to figure out. Those were like the first CEDH tournaments after the cards came out. But modern, a lot of decks are splashing colors specifically to get Nadus in. There are cards being built, or, decks being built around Nadu. And many, many tournaments are having most, if not all, of their top eights playing Nadu. Hmm. So people have been asking for an emergency ban, which <laughs> on uh, what was that the July twenty third edition of MTG Weekly, uh, the Magic the Gathering weekly little live stream mm-hmm. video they put out. They 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 said that they were not going to be making any bans before the next banned and restricted announcement on August twenty sixth. So people were very upset having to deal with another month of tournaments uh, with the Pro Tour coming up, another Pro Tour event coming up with uh, uh, regional championship qualifying tournaments coming up, of having to deal with Nadus, of having to deal with grief uh, and evoke a creature from Modern Horizons Mm. 2. I believe so, yes. Yeah, from Modern Horizons 2. And they're more worried about grief being banned in... (laughs) like legacy than they are modern uh but people have been wanting nadu banded modern for a while and they're very very upset by it mm. the the decision to wait now you brought up a good point of them kind of trying to move away from like emergency bans yeah i believe i believe he says in here uh in this we're looking at twitter right now the they posted the the clip from it but i believe he says in the in the video that emergency bans aren't usually don't happen have the effect that they want them to have basically Mm -hmm. so i i agree with that to an extent Mm -hmm. um a lot a lot of the times what they've tried to do and this happened with um oh my god what's that golgari creature where they tried to kill the combo piece i don't know oh i'm 
drawing a blank on it. I don't pay attention to the the modern format, to be honest with you. But people are, people are thinking, are, some people were positing, like, why not ban Shuko? Why not ban the, the, something mantle? It's something mantle, the zero mana artifact Mm -hmm. that has the untap ability added to the creature, whatever. Uh, We'll ban lightning griefs. It's like, uh, now, now it's just like, oh, we have to ban everything that has a zero equip cost in it just to depower Nadu. Uh, and then even if you are targeting Nadu with removal, there are people that are targeting Nadu once to get the, the trigger train rolling and then trigger and then get the triggers off of all their other creatures so that they have one trigger left available on Nadu if someone targets it with a removal. Mm-hmm. And so you still get to the Nadu trigger off of the removal that's being targeted. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like, I don't think there's a really a clean answer that would please everybody but ultimately specifically in modern if you aren't playing nadu you are at a disadvantage Mm -hmm. and the entire format has warped around that one card people don't like it it creates play patterns that are stagnant and boring yeah and this is coming from someone who's pulled several nadus and i have the beginnings of a nadu cedh deck because i know it's probably going to stick around maybe not tier one of cedh just because again dies to removal haha but in in commander specifically it can be dealt with Mm -hmm. it's not going to be a casual commander the problem is is the fact that it's like okay this creature has one trigger on it i need to make sure i have my pile of creatures that have one trigger on them or the pile that has had two triggers on them and then the pile that has no triggers on them and just going through that process and because the combo is Mm non-deterministic you just kind of have to keep going until you either eventually luck out of being able to continue the combo or you stumble into a win Mm -hmm. and those play patterns are just not fun that's fair um basically basically nobody likes this decision to wait um but I mean, it kind of remains to be seen. They're, it does, yeah. They're 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 definitely going to ban it. <laughs> I, I can't imagine they don't ban Nadu on the twenty sixth. If they don't ban Nadu on the twenty sixth, people are going to fucking rage. People are raging right now. Even more so. That's fair. Even more so. Anyway, we don't play modern. We don't play modern. Moving on. Secret lair. There's a lot of secret lair drops. On uh, to something that's not sad or not unfortunate so there's there's uh, been a, a a summer collection a summer the summer drop the summer drop for magic the gathering and you basically can't get any of it anymore sorry sorry uh they're printing them to limited <laughs> they're limited printing instead of print to demand uh you so they they have a whole lot of bundles uh, Brain Dead, Bloomborough, Showcase f- Arts. Um, there's like an Elevator One, Dead Land, Brain Dead Lands. Uh, Andrew McLean. But the ones that we want to talk about: Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Monty Python and the Secret Lair. Missed opportunity. Already sold out. Foil, non-foil. There's two volumes of it. All of it's sold out. I managed to get mine. Nice. So I'm very happy. But. This will be the first Secret Lair that I've bought. Very good. Fact. I wanted to get the Lord of the Rings like animated feature film Secret Lair, but the card choices they made were so bad. Yeah, they were not worth anything. The if you get like the highest quality blinged out non Secret Lair version of the cards, you could get all five of them for like two dollars. Yeah. So it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing, and I've looked at trying to like piecemeal buy them but because they were the secret lair and nobody bought them they're actually like expensive cards even though they're not good maybe uh maybe when you go to gen con somebody will walk up to you shove a microphone in your face ask you a random trivia question you get it right and they hand you a secret layer pack who knows that'd be fun that'd, that'd be, fun. be fun creators do that i'm a good it's they a good do. Time. so with uh magic magic the gathering cross monty python and the holy grail we have two volumes of secret lair one with five cards one with four cards in it and the four card one technically is three cards and a token uh, but they're each going to get a bonus card anyway but they're all monty python and the holy grail themed cards we have a reprint of the prodigal sorcerer as tim the enchanter two in a blue human wizard it's a one one you tap it deals one damage to any any target creature player anything mm-hmm. planeswalker there are some who call me tim <laughs> Uh, that is because the prodigal sorcerer is uh, colloquially known as Tim. Tim. 
because he's, he's just he's just a little Tim. Not really relevant in anything. Uh, <laughs> what is relevant? Three visits is we want a shrubbery. A shrubbery. One in a green sorcery. You search your library for a forest, put it on the battlefield, then shuffle. One that looks li- nice and not too expensive from the Knights Who Say Nee. Nee. Dismember is being reprinted as Tis But a Scratch. One and Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black mana. Target creature gets minus five, minus five until end of turn. It's dismembering. It's cutting off limbs. Yeah. It's a scratch. Mike Saints. Your arm's off. Just Tis But a Scratch. <laughs> Buried Alive is reprinted as Bring Out Your Dead to in a black. Search your library for up to three creature cards. Put them into your graveyard. I'm getting better. No, you're not. You'll be stone dead in a moment <laughs> when they're throwing all the dead bodies onto the pile I'm and one not of them's not dead. dead. He I'm says not, he's not dead. He says he's not dead. Ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, there's one double-sided card, and that is a Birds of Paradise reprint. On one side, you will have the African Swallow. For one green mana, you, is a flying bird, a zero one. You can tap it for a mana of any color. And then on the other side is the European Swallow, both of them carrying a coconut. It's really a simple question of weight ratios, ultimately. Ultimately. It's a du- it's just a double-sided fun card, technically making it not legal. <laughs> so you can't play it in a tournament, but African on one side, European on the other, it's pretty funny. What is the average airspeed velocity of a swallow? Afri- African or European? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the Speaking of, the Bridge of Death is a reprint now of the Door of Nothingness, a five-mana artifact that enters tapped. You can activate its ability for white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green, and tap. You sacrifice the Bridge of Death, and target player loses the game. What is your favorite color? Now, could this have been reprinted as some one of another artifact that's kind of more powerful? Yeah, uh, but that's really thematic. <laughs> you run it. You got to run it in a five-color deck, and you got to be like, "What's your favorite color?" And then you tap it. Blue, you, no, you, green. Like, no. Ah. And then you t- and then you tap all your mana. You tap it, and they lose. That's the only way you can play that card now. Uh, <laughs> my favorite reprint is Ashnod's Altar for three mana. It's an artifact. You could sacrifice a creature, get two colorless mana. It is Sir Bedivere's Scales. So logically, she weighs the same as a duck. She's made of wood and therefore a witch. A witch. But anyway, she turned me into a newt. I got better. Yes. Uh, and the last two that we know of are a Dark Depths. Uh, which is a legendary land, and the Merit Lage token, which is created by the Dark Depths. Uh, It enters the battlefield with 10 ice counters on it. You can pay 3 mana to remove an ice counter from it. Then if it has no ice counters, you sacrifice it. You get a 2020 Black Avatar creature token with flying and indestructible named Merit Lage. Uh, There's combos that involve Thespian Stage, where you basically create a copy of it that has no counters on it, so it immediately sacrifices itself, and you get a 2020 creature with flying and indestructible. That is the Castle of Ag, and then you create the Black Beast of Ag with it, which is very fun. Uh, there are also two uh, bonus cards that we have, I believe, have been leaked, but I was trying to find them on Twitter, and I couldn't find them again. Mm, One of them, I believe, is a goblin bombardment uh, when they're launching cows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a, the other one is a black card that I don't remember. No Holy Hand Grenade? Oh, that would be fun. That'd be fun if they reprinted Lightning Bolt as Holy Hand Grenade. <laughs> <laughs> or like a, like a Swords to Plowshare as the Holy Grail. Ooh, that would actually be very, very mm-hmm. appropriate. Like a Path to Exile or a Swords to Plowshare as a Holy Hand Grenade. There's like a million different references you could do with Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And this like barely even scratches the surface. Right. This, Wizards of the Coast, make a full Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, universes beyond set. A universes, a universes beyond aftermaths, because <laughs> that's what you guys like to do, right? I don't, I don't know. I feel like Assassin's Creed could have been a whole set. Assassin's Creed absolutely could have been a whole set. Money, the Python, and the Holy Grail. I don't think it'd be a whole set. <laughs> I think Money, Python, and the Holy Grail it would make sense to do like a, an Assassin's Creed size set. If they wanted to do a full, full set, they'd have to go into the entire Monty Python backlogs. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is uh, one of the few that is kind of held up relevance in uh in maybe not, i don't know i may have been behind the times but like most people don't know other works of monty python yeah yeah uh life of brian life of pie life of brian life of life brian, of brian. That's uh, so good. Bonnie Python and uh, Flying Circus. Yeah. There's a lot of great Monty Python things. Obviously, Holy Grail is the most popular. Uh, if you wanted to buy The Secret Lair, and you haven't yet, 
look on eBay. It'll be more expensive. Uh, what I would love if they did a volume three, uh, King Arthur, Arthur, King of the Britons, Kenrith the Returned King, so that way you can run all of the Monty Python cards. Oh, in the that'd deck. be good. That'd be good. That'd be fun. And then all of the, I think making a, a Knights of the Round Table uh, with Arthur as Kenrith, and then you can get you can get all of the other ones, Sir Bedivere, uh, uh, Sir Ro- Brave Sir Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Brave Sir Robin ran away. They need to, they they didn't make the two coconuts. They didn't. No. That would be that would be a great Swift Foot Boots. <laughs> <laughs> so make another one and put more than five cards in a secret layer. Anyway, uh, I think it's very fun and I'm very excited to get them. I'm very excited. My uh, my my lady friend is very excited to get hers and hang them up on the wall, and then we can slowly, slowly but surely convert her into the into a player of magic and then we can all be poor together hell yeah it'll be great lastly last news item of the day nice and little wrap up comics comics yes comics mm-hmm. uh, idw is a comic brand that has held the rights to make dungeons and dragons and magic the gathering comics and graphic novels for 14 years now but those rights have been moved to dark horse Comics. Dark Horse Comics has announced it will launch a fresh comic book version for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, bringing both beloved franchises back into the comic medium. New stories featuring iconic characters from both universes are set to release in 2025 as part of the ongoing celebration of Magic the Gathering's 50th anniversary. I don't think that's accurate. That's what this article says. I think that's D&D. Magic the Gathering just had their 30th anniversary. Yeah. So Wow. So wow. much time has passed in this year. I know, right? Way to go, Screen Rant. Fucking, fucking idiots. You stupid, dumb idiot. Anyway, collaborating with Hasbro's Wizards of the Coast, Dark Horse Comics aims to honor these franchises by creating new and exciting content that will excite longtime fans and attract new ones. So Dark Horse Comics has been known for making a lot of very fun, sort of smaller run comic series. They've helped Critical Role yeah. with their various, uh, like, like background stories for campaign one and campaign two. Um, We also, we also have talked about on the show, the manga that's going to be coming out uh, for magic gathering. Oh, there it is. Actually it is. Oh, what was it called again? Destroy all humankind. They can't be regenerated. Magic, the gathering manga, which will come with a promo card as well. I think it'd be fun if these specifically the magic, the gathering comics came with like promo cards and stuff. That'd be very fun. Um, We'll of course, wait to see what they actually end up announcing, but it's nice to see that the that there's a company actually doing something with the IP, right? I was gonna say, I, we could have done a whole bit the uh, IDW or whatever it oh. was. What are they? What is they called? Oh, IDW. IDW. They yeah. have the comic rights to what? Who's heard of them? Who's heard of them? Exactly. Magic the Gathering comics? Never. 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 Yeah. Not in my good also, Christian household. Speaking of speaking of Christianity, um, the eternal rivals of the Christians. Magic Every, the Gathering players? No, oh. no, 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 those are no, it's D and D players, but uh, yes. Satanic Panic and all that. Indeed. When I, when I read IDW, of course my my idiotic brain goes, oh, IDF, <laughs> Israeli Defense Force. And I was like, okay, well we're not touching that with a ten foot pole. <laughs> no, twenty nine and a half foot pole. I almost thought you were going to go over to the other uh, thing in the news right now, the Olympic opening ceremony. Oh my God! All right, so I work in an NBC affiliate in Cincinnati, and we have <laughs> we've been airing the Olympics, which is fun. I love the Olympics. I love watching all the sporting events. It's a wonderful time. But that opening ceremony was, uh, huh. Oh boy! Yeah, it was. I think the idea of entering, all, of showing all the athletes on the River Seine, sending them down, it was, it, it was a good idea. They go under the bridges. The bridges have a whole bunch of shit. France, known weird, known entities of weird. The French are <laughs> okay. They got fucking weird on the bridges. Oh, I haven't heard anything about that, but. Well, I mean, they. they well, were, well, I haven't heard anything specifically about what was on the bridges. Ah, uh, well, they were doing like they were doing like Fashion Week stuff. And okay. It was clear. It was very, very. Cl- well, there were a lot of people that thought they were mocking the Last Supper, uh, painting, which the defenders of it was like, no, they were referencing this other thing that has to do with French history, and it's like, yes, maybe, but. <laughs> 
surely everyone knew what was going to happen. Yeah. So what I've heard about is one, they couldn't fit all the athletes onto boats. No. Like some just had to stay on the side. Uh, they called South the Republic of Korea, South Korea, <gasps> North Korea. They called them the People's Republic of South Korea. Oof. It's like, ooh, that's not accurate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, North Korea is not allowed to compete in the Olympic Games. Oh. Yeah, France was, uh, it was a little cringe. Yeah. It was a little bit cringe. But the games are going on, and it's a fun time. I think, it, I think the Olympics is a net positive for humanity. Yeah. Despite the weird opening ceremonies, I got, I gotta say, the cor- the craziest and coolest opening ceremony in recent years was Beijing in two thousand and eight. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also frightened me because they got two thousand and eight Chinese men, yeah, to be in sync in synchronicity with one another. Synchronicity. Syn- they were they were synchronized and banging on drums. And yeah, like, that's super cool. That is super cool. Also, I am scared of the Chinese government now. Holy crap! Like they can they can organize very well. <laughs> they can organize very very well. Anyway, anyway, we will end this episode, episode seventy two of the Duels and Mandadors podcast, as we always do, taking questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. The best way to get your co- uh, your questions and comments submitted is through the Patreon. We post a Patreon thread for questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. We have Brandon Vol who asks, "What is your must have card from Bloomborough?" My must-have card from Bloomborough, I pulled. It is Rao, Crackling Wit. The Is It Planeswalker, two blue, red. It's a four-starting loyalty planeswalker. It has a static ability. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you put a loyalty counter on him. Plus one to make a one-one blue and red otter creature token with prowess. Minus three to draw three cards, discard two. And then minus ten, the ultimate. Draw three cards. You get an emblem with instants and sorceries. You cast have storm. I wanted it because it will be going immediately into my Narset and Lightning Exile hmm. deck, yeah. which is very exciting. Makes sense. Makes it a lot of sense. What about you? Uh, so it's one, I don't have a place for it. I just think it's a really cool card, and I've seen some dumb shit you can do with it, mm-hmm. which is Hazel's Brewmaster. Oh. It's a uh, three and a black for a Squirrel Warlock. I believe it's a three, four. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may exile target card from a gr- uh, graveyard. Foods you control have all activated abilities of creature cards exiled under Hazel's Brewmaster. Oh, so it's kind of like a like a uh, the cauldron from yeah the Agatha's Wilds of cauldron yeah. Agatha's school cauldron. But you combine if you combine that with Sam Loyal Attendant, mm-hmm. who decreases all activated abilities of food by one. Yeah, yeah. There's some cool stuff you can do with that. That sounds that sounds like a fun little thing you could build around even. Yeah, it would be probably use. Uh, uh, do the Sam and Frodo just for the color combo and have Sam because he creates your food, he decreases that cost and then yeah, have it as a hidden commander deck with just trying to find Hazel's mm-hmm. Brewmaster, mm-hmm. mill fine. a bunch of stuff in the graveyard, exile stuff and then have food that can do dumb shit yeah, like infinite mana with like, because there's like devoted druid yeah, you can go, yeah. you just it's uh, untap, put a minus one minus, minus one counter. counter on it if you can get a plus one plus one counter on it, then you get infinite. Well, it's you only. don't need a plus one. It's food. It doesn't care oh, about minus one counter. Right. If you were to turn your food into a creature, then yeah. That's care. right. It does. It doesn't care about the counters. Yeah. That's fun. That's fun. That's a fun little combo. Um, I also want to shout out Helga, Skittering Seer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the frog that's bant, green, white, blue. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it has the ability to be... The anti CEDH commander, which I really enjoyed. There's one uh, with Zyrus, which is green, red, blue. I never remember the color of that. One. Teamer. That's Teamer. Uh, that punishes other people drawing cards. Hmm. Uh, Helga, Skittering Seer, is card draw in the command zone. It is ramp in the command zone. Uh, it, it, it's a very good card. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're wanting to cast big creatures. You're going to be ramping off of her because she is a mana dork. Uh, you're going to be drawing cards when you cast your four mana and greater creatures. And uh, it's just, while not as anti-CEDH as Zyrus can be, I like the idea you have green, white, and blue. Green has a lot of shenanigans with big creatures and big stompy creature-based plays, which is one way to really push through like the the mid-range combo hell that mm-hmm. CEDH can fall into. 
while also giving you access to the best counter spell magic in blue with lockout and stacks pieces in white. And then you just, you lock down everyone and then suddenly you have a board of powerful creatures and you slam a fucking crater hoof and you just win the old fashioned way, you know? Good old fashioned crater hoof. So I like it. I'm a, I'm a fan of that one. Uh, but that is Brandon Vol, our $15 a month patron on the Patreon, which you get your name right at the end of the show if you if you do that. So thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. That was a good question. That was a good question. Uh, We also take questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the TikTok Live chat as well. Sam, what do we got from the TikTok Live today? Friend of the show, Lincoln Hall, has jumped in to say it's not kicker. It is kicker. We've been over this. It is kicker. I don't care. I don't. Is it literally kicker? No, it's offspring. It's gift, but it's the same shit. (laughs) Extra cost, extra effect. Uh, is Assassin's Creed good in Commander? Uh, yes. There are some Assassin's Creed cards that are very good in Commander. Yes, free-running cards specifically that have a reduced cost if you, uh, if, was it, deal combat damage with, with an Assassin or your Commander. Yep. Um, there are pieces and fun Commanders in Assassin's Creed. Uh, I'm playing, sh- I have a Shao Jun deck, which yep. I have set up as a Popper Commander deck, and that one's very fun. I have Bossom. As a regular commander deck. Bassem. Uh, Edward Kenway is one of the, it's like kind of now the premier uh, pirate yeah. commander because he, he deals with pirates, assassins, and vehicles, and creating treasure, and stealing cards. It's like all the all the classic pirate everything shit. you would Everything you would want in a pirate. Literally. Literally. But and then uh, the starter decks have some fun commanders mm-hmm. there as well. Uh, there's the five color Ezio, which is powerful. There are a lot of powerful things, but as a set, it just isn't very cohesive yeah. in a way. So it's, it's it was not hard. built for any one format. It was built to be thematic, which is totally fine. Absolutely. I, there's a lot of fun cards there. I'm glad that we opened up a couple packs. Um, we have a couple packs for our Chaos Draft, which will be very, or our Chaos Limited pool which is very exciting for the end of the year i can't wait for that which let's see we're going to have we're going to have murders of karlov manor we're going to have ravnica remastered ravnica remastered um thunder junction i feel like i'm missing another set from earlier in the year yeah we'll just pull the box out we'll just pull the box out why not all right so we got a box here and every set that's come out this year we've been setting aside packs uh, and we're keeping them sealed, and we're going to open these packs all at uh, at the end of the year. We're going to make a limited deck out of them, which is a 40-card deck. Okay, so we got uh, Ravnica Remastered, Murders of Karlov Manor, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, MH3, Assassin's Creed, Bloomborough. We're going to end up having Duskmorn, House of Horror, and Foundation packs in here as well. Um, technically, Fallout was a thing, but we're not buying a Fallout Collector Booster. No for these because those are like 30 doll hairs which is a little bit excessive um might pick up uh, a convention booster pack at the convention we yes getting one of the convention like mystery boosters or something i think would be fun it's kind of like a commemorate like we went to gen con it's a fun thing um we're probably i would like to do more on-demand commander pods than we did I don't think we really even did that at Gen Con. No, last year we uh, we did, did the two. We did uh, 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 yeah, two precon events. We did the Lord of the Rings precon event and the Commander Masters precon event. Mm-hmm. Those were precon precon events at Gen Con are great. They have a chaos one where it's just any mm-hmm. Commander precon, and I'm a little bit skeptical of those because I feel like they're going to be bad Commander precons. But I also want to look into it just to see what they are, see what they got, because uh, you you might luck into something pretty good there, and it's just fun to sure. like, get a precon. Um, but doing some more on-demand commander pods. We did that a little bit with um, at uh, SCG, SCG Con, Con here in Cincinnati, uh, but that's kind of like the main and only event that they really have is like on-demand stuff unless mm-hmm. you're entering a tournament. So, but yeah, that's a that's a fun little it's a fun little. Could thing. always sit down at a table and just pop out a deck and just stare at people as they walk by. They make eye contact. And you're like, you want you want you want to get in? Uh-huh. I'm gonna know. Uh, but the fun thing about the on-demand pods at Gen Con, they're $12 to get the tickets for, uh, to get the event tickets for, but then you get prize tickets uh, with them, and they do all the organizing, and you can just get sat with random people, and I think it's a pretty sweet deal of just something to do. Pretty sweet. All right. Anything else? That's all. All right. Nothing too crazy this week. Uh, we're very excited to see how John High Height goes. Height. Uh, John Height is a kite. Uh, does for... <laughs> Was is the coast president? It'll probably take several episodes of the podcast for us to find a good a good thing for him, um, unless he does something 
immediately, and we have to come up with a nickname for him right. immediately. Right. I, I I have high hopes for him. I think he's going to end up being pretty good, just because he seems like he has the experience for it, and he gives a shit about the products, mm-hmm. because he uses the products, which is the biggest, biggest thing in my mind. We haven't had that. No. Basically, since we started playing the game Magic the Gathering. You know what would probably be a really good like PR move for him, is if he... If could find the time and get on an episode of like Shuffle Up and Play or Game Nights or Commander at Home or something like that. Get hit t- set aside a week of of your time or like do it over a couple weekends over the course of like five months. And it's mm-hmm. like show up at Commander at Home, show up at Game Nights, show up at Shuffle Up and Play, show up at f- fucking. I, I mean the the problem the problem with D anD D is there aren't a lot of like one-off like one-shot style things like i could totally see him like hitting up critical role and doing something but critical roles i think clearly going to have campaign four using dagger heart mm-hmm. and not DD. but it could just be like a thank you for everything you've done for the game system i think that would be a fun one shot yeah. using the one D system since i don't think they're going to end up using that for mm-hmm. their fourth campaign but like just getting himself out there like actually showing that like yeah i know how to play these games and yeah. i enjoy them and i care and yeah that would be i think that would be really really big but all of that remains to be seen it's not up to us to decide nope but we will tell you about it when we say when we know more news yeah yeah we'll do that every other week without fail but in the meantime <laughs> we love you very much and as always 